And when I ask architects, what's the definition of the word profit? A, money left over at the end of the year by happenstance. B, something you plan for to reinvest in the future of your firm. Or C, a dude in the Bible. The answer usually is C. They just don't have any clue about what that means. It's a dirty word. Episode 154. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, you're missing out on the valuable free practice building resources I share only via email. Getting on the list is simple. Visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the green Join Today button. I am your host, Enoch Sears. To get more profit or efficiency in your firm, check out this business tip from Peter Drucker. What's measured improves. Now, I found this to be so true, and as a firm owner, you must be tracking your financial key performance indicators. One of the easiest ways to do this is with a software application like ArchiOffice. Get a live walkthrough of the software by visiting ArchiOffice.com demo, and a big thank you to ArchiOffice for supporting this show. As a loyal listener to this show, chances are that you have either started an architecture firm sometime in the past, or you're thinking of doing so sometime in the future. Today's guest is an accomplished architect, leader, and author of the book, How to Start and Operate Your Own Design Firm. He's the Senior Vice President of Rubling and Associates at JMT Division. In 2015, he served as the 53rd Chancellor of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects. And with that, I'd like to welcome Albert Rubling Jr., FAIA, to the show. Well, Al, welcome to the Business of Architecture show. I'm uh, honored to be here. Great. Now, I do have your book in my hands right here, and I have, I have read it, How to Start and Operate Your Own Design Firm, a guide for interior designers and architects. Tell me about the first writing of the book. What does it take to get a book like this published? Well, it's some ancient history. We'll go back to um, 1993 and the, uh, the first edition, which is hard to believe um, all those years ago when I started. Um, I was very been active with the American Institute of Architects, and I was on the National Practice Committee at that time. And I wrote and produced a um, seminar on that topic at at our national convention in Houston, Texas. And I was so inspired by the 500 people in in attendance that day that I took the material and uh, put together a white paper. And I asked at the time if the AIA press would be interested And they said, uh, no, we're into coffee table books. And um, so I got permission from the EVP CEO at the time to market the book. And so one day it hit me that at the AIA conventions, there are always the publishers for the various books on architecture. They come to the convention every year. So I printed out a dozen white papers and I walked around from... Van Ronston Reithold to John Wiley to um, all the other ones. And um, it was a fascinating experience to speak to these architectural editors. I had no appointments because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any better. So I was rather entrepreneurial in saying, I'll just go and cold call these people and see what happens. And McGraw-Hill, a fellow named Joel Stein, took a real interest and uh, the Nostra and Reinhold, if I'm pronouncing their name correctly, showed interest. And uh, they both offered a similar contract to write the book. And uh, I went with McGraw Hill because I could pronounce their name. And I thought people would have heard of them. So um, I wrote that book in 90 days uh, from 4 o'clock in the morning until 630 because I was running my business. And I uh, coached my three sons in recreation sports in the evening. So time balance. So I basically, they gave me uh, uh, six months and I did it in three months. And my sponsoring editor said that was the first time that he's ever had an editor, um, I mean, uh, an author beat their deadline. So it was, uh, I was on a mission and I really wanted to help people. So but approaching folks at the AIA convention was the way I was able to do it. Fascinating. So what, what does a book contract look like this in terms of finances? 
Well, uh, I certainly am not James Mishner, and I'm not uh, certainly not any of the, the, the big scribes. Essentially, uh, I, I believe back in the day, there was there might have been a uh, maybe a two thousand dollar advance um, uh, written on the book. So I'm not a Clinton getting twenty million or anything like that. Uh, and then the the balance uh, basically uh, is paid once you delivered, not the balance, excuse me, it was 75% came back once you uh, uh, completed the first um, uh, drafts with all of their um, editors, which that's an experience in and of itself with copy editors. Uh, these people that live, their whole life is surrounded by syntax. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. And uh, then the balance comes due once it goes to print. And then the royalties are such that uh, you have to remember this was written at a time when there was uh, no Google, there was no um, eBooks, uh, there was no Kindles. Uh, so back in the day, everything was printed. Now those contracts got adjusted over time because now most of the books are purchased online and uh, through eBooks and what have you. And most of the students around the country buy it that way. Uh, for professional practice courses and what have you. Yep. And so do you get ongoing royalties from this? How does a royalty situation work out when you get a book published? Yes, there are ongoing royalties. And uh, basically, it's interesting. Uh, the way my deal is structured is I make more money on uh, the ebooks than I do on printed material. Uh, I guess it's just because it's easier and simpler, right? So, uh but once again, it is not something that is uh, incredibly lucrative, I guess, unless you're selling millions of units. But the book certainly has outsold our publisher's uh, expectations. And uh, they're rather modest. They're so modest that it's just, it's nice to have some little, it might buy me a, a new driver every year for the golf course. But uh, it's the people. It's the people that reach out and write emails that I, have helped or they need assistance or whatever. And that's, that's the real reward. It's not, I didn't write the book for a financial reward. So, um, entrepreneurially, it was more to enhance the quality of life for people rather than the monetary. Yep. Well, and um, thanks for sharing that Al. So I'm guessing what a couple thousand bucks a year. If that it's five, 600 bucks a year, it just depends on the one that how many schools use the book in their, in their uh, classes. And, um, you know, it's funny. Well, every I've never gotten a hate email. <laughs> They've been 100% positive. And what I wrote was that the, this book, starting your firm can be a very lonely experience. And so this book was to behave as your silent partner. And it was to be a book not to be read and put on a shelf and never seen again that it was to be your buddy. It was supposed to be your reference, your reference book to, uh, you know, assist you in, in selecting a partner, you know, the partner sanity test, which is something that I'm really going to evolve in the next edition because uh, obviously in the past seven, eight years, you know, I'm teaching now at the University of Maryland and I teach entrepreneurship and leadership for careers in architecture. And so, what I've learned in my laboratory with my students and studying the e-myth and looking at how people are wired, it, that's a really great way to measure partners. And uh, so I first wrote rather naively about the topic because I had a bad partner. And uh, so I learned from that. And so I tried it. I did it in my words, obviously. And since that time, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of product on the market that one has learned from, and uh, I've really certainly honed that in a, in, a, in a better direction, I think, to communicate. Yep. And when you say product in the market, what do you mean? Yeah, books. People write books on, like, like the E-Myth. The E-Myth changed my life. You know, Gerber's book about being entrepreneurial, managerial, and technical, the E-M-N-T of, of business, and that um, you need to have balance. And as I tell my students, you know, 80% of architecture firms are two people or less, yet 80% of architects work for 20% of, I mean, 2% of the firms. I mean, so it's just, it's amazing the, the, the paradox in our profession, right? So I, um, 
I think it's really important for my graduates to know how are they going to fit in in a firm at age 22, 23, 24, if they know how could, can they be a principal in the future? And you know, genetically, you know, how are how do they behave? And can they were they going to be a manager? Because they can all be partners. You can have technical mark partners. You can have managing partners. You can have entrepreneurial markers. You need all three. And whether that's in one person, in one body, or in two bodies, or three, or fifty, even Gensler down to down to the smallest firm has to have that. And uh, so it's really important to understand how we're wired, not only to know that we're going to get along, but that we have our skill sets. Because not everybody is wired to be a visionary salesperson. Not everybody's wired to be. The, the greatest person in putting a building together and not everybody's wired to make sure that all the numbers in a column add up to a hundred. So how do you balance that out? And so the more you, you talk about that within your firm and you have a recognition of that, uh, I believe the more successful you're going to be in sustaining your firm. And what suggestions do you give to people to be able to identify either their own inherent qualities or if they're looking to work with a partner, how to see if that person is going to be a fit? There are, um, we use in our firm, uh, we use an online behavioral assessment service uh, called the PXT. It's a profile XT. And um, with PXT, we have created, they have a, they have a, a, um, a category, a profile, dangerous word, they have a profile for an architect. And we've taken that profile and we've created one for a principal architect, a managing architect, and a design architect, te technical architect. And we've said, based on our experience, one needs to be more towards this end or this end, this end based on the, the job description. So that when we have our staff take that assessment or we have new um, uh, hires take that assessment, we know where our next generation of leaders are coming from. One can't judge an architect by its cover. You just don't know. We, you know, we can certainly, we don't even look hardly at their portfolios anymore. Uh, we speak to them about their experiences and leadership and getting a sense of how they think. And uh, the, the good designers stand out and the good entrepreneurial people really stand out. The managers take time because you know, they need to have that experience. But I do it in my class. I have all 21 students um, basically assessed every year. And um, it's great to see, for example, the top student I had entrepreneurially uh, in the eight years I've been doing this came to my class last week as a guest speaker. And uh, he is a strategic thinker. And because he told me now, he's being very nice, but he told me because of my class, he now is leading a strategic thinking studio in Gensler. He is responsible for helping Gensler figure out Generation Y and how their model is going to, their studio model is going to work in the next 15 years. And it's just, it, it, it was so rewarding to hear because this, this young man is just brilliant. And, uh, he said he, he loves design, but his his skill set, which came out in the class, he's most proud of and passionate is strategic thinking. And so he's been able to apply the profile that we had. He was recruited right out of school, and um, he's, he's going to China for eight weeks. He's going here and he's going there, and they see the value in him, and um, it's wonderful. So there are ways to do it, forward-thinking companies – do this type work. Fortune 500 do it all the time. So how do we get architects to think that way, to go that way? So um, once you become a student of this, it's like, it's just another variable. It's not perfect, but you can look at a portfolio. You can look at a person in eight seconds, make a great first impression or not. And um, you can look at their writing skills, their verbal skills, what have you. Look at their experience. But this is another way. The way they think is really important. So in our firm, for example, we know who the, who the future leaders are managerially. And so we coach them that way. This, this Profile XT gives coaching 
um, reports and what have you, so that the people are comfortable. The ones that don't want to be, don't want to take Dale Carnegie because they don't want to sell, we don't force them to do that, right? But in the past, how would we have known that other than other than them taking it and hating it and not using it, right? So it really helps understand how people are wired, and I think that's what's important. Which which category do you fall in? <laughs> well, one would uh, one can evolve over time, and uh, I think when I started my firm thirty five years ago, I really did not understand. I don't know if the word entrepreneur was really a trend word at the time. Leader wasn't a trend word at the time, um, and uh, I felt like I was pretty balanced. I mean, I was. I think relatively popular or whatever. I mean, I could speak to clients and the firm that I worked for allowed moonlighting, right? So I was making more money moonlighting than I was working in the firm. So that taught me that I had a, an ability to communicate. And um, obviously I had to manage myself because it had work had to be done. And obviously I could design and be technical because it work had to be done. And yet I knew that from that experience that I, began to become more comfortable dealing with the clients, promoting the work, and doing the work wasn't as important and uh, to me, and I could hire people to do that. So my goal was to hire people that did the things that I was not as comfortable doing better than I, so that I could empower them and we could be quite a team. So it evolved over time, you know, in regards to experience. So that was probably that was the first ten years of my practice because I, I was a I was a student of business books. But Max Dupree from um, Herman Miller wrote one of the first books on leadership, and it was called uh, uh, Leadership is an Art. And then he wrote Leadership Jazz, and those books changed my life. And I be, learned that I was a leader, and uh, so my mission became more entrepreneurial. And so that's what I tried to do for the past 25 years is be really focused yeah. on that. So I probably went from 33, 33, 34 to where today I'm probably 72 or we'll say 70, uh, 2010. And um, I'm only 10 because I don't do it. They, they don't pay me to do that anymore. I'm paid to be the 70. You know? Yep, yep. Well, you know, there's probably people listening to this that fall in each one of these categories, and I think it'd be an interesting discussion to get your perspective on the challenges that each one of these archetypes would face if they're starting their own firm. For instance, if you're a technical type architect and you want to start your own firm, what are the challenges that you're going to face as opposed to someone who's the managerial type or someone that's the entrepreneurial type? Great question. Um, so I'll share with you... Uh, basically a case study or experiences. I'll storytell for a minute because that's what I do. Um, I've spoken to a lot of folks. I've given seminars around the United States on this topic through the AIA. And the interesting thing is, is that if one doesn't know what one is, and let's just say using the old story, my in-laws have hired me to do their vacation house, or my brother-in-law has hired me to do my, his, his new house, right? or a small office building. And I've been laid off and I'm, I'm gonna do this job, right? And if I'm a technical person, it's gonna be really well done. It's not gonna leak. Everything's gonna work right. And I'm probably gonna be focused on doing that job. Not thinking that I should probably go out and market because where's the next one coming from? And so do I just trust myself that I'm going to get this job done and the next one will just out of magic show up because of my reputation or my brother-in-law is going or my in-laws are going to refer me to somebody else. I mean, this is how Phil Johnson started, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing. His first project was the Seagram's building. I mean, it's like amazing, you know, it's a little different league with that, but so a technical person, they, I always jokingly say they ask the question, clients why because clients never know they know best you know the architect knows best to how the proportion how it's supposed to work and the detailing of it and all those things so 
you may finish that house. Where's the next one coming from? Well, you might have a construction sign up at the house and maybe somebody might see it. Or if you're not thinking entrepreneurially and you're in your basement of your house or you're in your office and you never get out to meet people or network, that second job could be a challenge. A managerial person is sort of the same way. They're going to be looking at the work. They're going to make sure that all the numbers add up. They're going to make sure that all the right marbles are in the right color in the right box, you know, and um, they're not really thinking vision wise, where's the next one coming from? So they'll focus on, okay, I have to get this done this week and next week and this, and they may not want to really do that work because they're not the doer, they're the manager, but they reluctantly do it knowing that they may not be the best at it, but they'll get it done. So then you have the entrepreneur and as the joke goes, the entrepreneur gets that first job and then they're like, God, now I got to do it. And they don't really want to do it because they want to be, get the next one. And so they reluctantly have to manage a deadline, their deadline adverse, because they are, as I say, they're honeybees. They want to be out pollinating the flowers and they want to be out. And so they know the value during the, during the eight hour prime time is to be out and about. And then in the evening, get the work done. And some evenings you have to be out and about networking, what have you, depending on what kind of line of work you're doing. Um, and, but then doing the work is really tough because they don't really want to write the specs. They don't really want to, they may not even care how the through wall flashing works or what have you. But, and so they may hire a friend to do that for them or what have you, because that's not their strength as they go through. Right. So, everybody's different. So the more balanced you are, if you're third, if you're perfect, one third, one third, one third, that's why I think most architecture firms are two people or less because they don't want to let go and delegate and empower somebody else to do the work. They want to do it all. And so they enjoy that. And then they wonder why it's so hard for getting, finding new work or meeting the deadline or, you know, having a problem in the field. And so it's really challenging because there's no backup. There's no ability for them to leverage. So the medium sized firm, which I've been for 35 years until we sold our firm, that was a challenging size firm, but you had resources to do the work. And so what I was fortunate in is that I had a partner that was the T, I had a partner that was the M and I was the E. So it allowed me to do my highest and best use. And that should be everyone's goal is to all, for just peace of mind and not be uh, upset with your life to be doing what you like most of the time. It's impossible to do it hundred percent of the time, but it sure would be nice, but that's not life. Right. So um, does that answer your question? It does. And do you recommend that people seek out partners or that they, they go it alone? What's your thought on that? <laughs> You're you've great, great questions. Um, the Dean, my, my boss tells a story that, when he graduated with his master's degree, he and three of his buddies sat around one night and were drinking beer and said, Hey, I got this house to do. You guys want to, you want to form a firm? I mean, there's a case study. It's the absolute worst you know, way to say, Hey dude, we're going to do this. We're going to get together. Right. I mean, really I mean, who's going to do what? Right. And so you find out the hard way and imagine it didn't sustain, they didn't sustain themselves. Because who knows what they had? They had four people that respected each other that got through the rigors of an architecture program and they could drink beer. But, uh, you know, what did, where did it go beyond that, right? So what I write in the book and what I have my students understand, because in my class, I, I form them from teams into firms. And in the firms, they know where they fit in, that they have to do a presentation from, you know, I'm the construction guy or I'm the, I'm the person that does the design work and I'm the manager of the firm and I'm the salesperson, I'm the entrepreneur. So here they are, they haven't graduated yet and they're role playing because that's our profession is theater, right? So I, that's what I believe. So they're role playing and here they are at a young age seeing the value in that as they go through. So I think it comes down to how stubborn is the individual because if they want to do it all, so be it, do it all. But chances are 
one of those three you're not going to be stellar in, right? So one's going to suffer somewhere along the line to maintain that balance. So that, I think that's the ultimate challenge because I think most architects have thought at some point in their career, what would it look like to have my name on a sign, you know, the shingle that you always talked about, you know, and uh, are they really cut out for that? And most people that I've seen it through business advisory groups and what have you, the, the corporate people that work for the large firms, they're not wired to be the small firm, the entrepreneur. And you really have to have an entrepreneur in order to sustain your business. If you don't, you're not going to sustain your business. It's just not. You have to develop, even if you're just doing um, uh, basements for people, or you're doing some sort of small commercial work that you hook up with a contractor. Yes, you can do that work and not be very entrepreneurial as long as they don't run out of business, as long as they, yeah, if you've got one client. But the entrepreneurial spirit is, is what gets you outside the box and get other type clients. The challenge is if you're entrepreneurial, the managers and the technical people don't believe a word you say. They just think you're full of it because you're out selling and you're trying to bring this work in. And of course, you're going to say yes to everything. And you're going to say, yes, we can do it. And yes, we'll beat that deadline. And yes, we'll beat that budget. And that drives the M&T people nuts <laughs> because it's never enough fee and it's never enough time to get the job done. So, but you got to have an entrepreneurial person in my opinion. So for, for those people who aren't naturally entrepreneurs, what would you say are your, your top tips for them uh, to be able to survive and to flourish? The most important thing is to recognize that and say that if I don't have that skill set and that reading the e myth, I recommend to everybody starting out. It, it's just a great book. And Gerber uses a lot of simple storytelling of fictitious people, I think. But, um, if, if you're true to yourself and you trust yourself that you're not entrepreneurial to get the job done, you really need to find somebody that's going to help you do that. And then, my God, are you going to share it with them? You know, do you want to, you want to cross that, you know, uh, Rubicon to say, yeah, w I need you. You know, you're going to help grow this firm because I have to have a respect as a manager or a technical person that this entrepreneur is going to do their job and they're going to, they're hunters. They're going to go hunting and they're going to bring back the quarry for us to keep in the cage or to eat, as they say, because I'm not a hunter. And if I'm not a hunter, so I have a classic M and a classic T that I've had for 30 years and they hate hunting and I love hunting. So I make sure the manager keeps the quarry in the cage and then when we have to eat some, the technical guy gets it and don't put him up in front of people to sell because he doesn't want to do that. You know, so you have to trust yourself first to say, I need this help. And then beyond that, being true to yourself is then finding someone trustworthy that will also be committed to this endeavor that we need each other. Right. So how are we going to sustain, grow, have an exciting time together. And I think that's hard for a lot of people. I really do. Which part is hard? It's hard for people to accept the fact that they are where their skill sets are. For example, I have my students every year, it's like sort of this laboratory information. I have my students every year uh, read the EMF. And, um, they come to class and they have to stand up Dale Carnegie wise in front of the class and say, my name is Al Rubling and I think that I am X, Y, and Z. Okay. I'm, I'm 50, 40, 10. I say to the class, what say you? Cause you've worked with this student for three years in the studio, right? And it becomes an auction and perceptions reality. I may think I'm a 50, 40, 10, but my classmates think that I'm a 70, 20, 10. 
And so I can't sit down until I agree with the, st with the class what it is, the perception of what I am. Okay? So we go through that exercise. And so everybody has a number. And they're in teams. And then the, the next effort is to say, is your team in balance? Some teams are, some aren't. Some are really low on entrepreneurs. Some are really low on technical. So the goal is to get this team in balance. Then I bring Dale Carnegie in to talk about skills and what have you. Then they take the PXT. The PXT confirms per the Rubling mindset, the Rubling model of the EM and T. Then over spring break, they have to get their teams in balance. And we have Survivor Island. And the rules are you can keep two people on a team, but you've got, you, you know how everybody is wired and it's your job to go out and recruit people to be on your team to keep your, your firm and your team in balance. And then when they come back from spring break and they're in balance, then I, we call them a firm. So now the firm is in balance because now these students all know we're, 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 we're good entrepreneurially, we're good managerially, and we're good technically. So now they know in doing that. Wouldn't it be great if we knew how our partners wired and that we're going to be um, in sync with them? And Because my partner that I had many years ago, we both wanted to do the same thing. And it was so frustrating because we were both out selling and nobody was doing the work. I, and I, it, took me a, it took me a year and a half to figure that out. So it was very frustrating. So the first book I wrote was, how do you not have that happen? So you have to have a dialogue to say, so what are you interested in? And are you being truthful? You know, are you committed to this? It's almost like it's a marriage, right? So how do you, how are you going to, how are we going to uh, be successful? You know, so you have to be very honest with each other as you go through that. So the students go through this whole semester of figuring out who they are and how they're going to work with each other, whose responsibilities are what. Then they make a presentation at the end of the year for a fictitious project on how they're going to be um, selected. And if they use the word design, they're fired. They're, they, this is not about design because they're all great. They're, they're the best designers. All four firms were shortlisted because of their portfolio. And I do not want to hear one word about design. If you do, you're fired. So I want to hear about your why. I want to hear about your mission. I want to hear how you're organized. Who's the, who's the vision person? How are you managing the project? Who's your designer? Who's your construction person? How am I as the owner going to be working with you over the next four years on this project? So it teaches them that part of the business, which architects are so poor. And I commend you for what you're doing because I think architects are the worst business people out there. And so what, what we're trying to do is get that word out, right? So They're, they're up there for sure. <laughs> it sounds like a remarkable yeah. class, Al. It is. It is. And I, I always open it like I do my seminars and I always start out with a multiple guest question. And I have a room full of 500 architects and I ask, you know, how many have started within the past year? How many started five years ago? Who's thinking about starting? Uh, to put a bag over your head so I won't tell your, your boss you're here. That kind of thing, right? And so I've got all this diversity of experience out there. And I said, it's interesting. When I ask architects, what's the definition of the word profit? A, money left over at the end of the year by happenstance. B, something you plan for to reinvest in the future of your firm. Or C, a dude in the Bible. The answer usually is C. They just don't have any clue about what that means. It's a dirty word. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture.
The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.